Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. No suit today, but uh, maybe next time. So, a recent paper came out from MIT called Breaching a Carbon Threshold Could Lead to Mass Extinction. So, I'm going to look at this paper in detail and also the uh, press re release that went along with it, but I'll go to the actual source paper. And it's a very complex paper, but I'll try to distill some of the key features of it to let you know, um, you know, how, how basically the carbon system in the oceans could tip into um, a state where there's all of these different reinforcing, accelerating feedbacks, which creates tremendous amounts of ocean acidification and... Uh, could result in a uh, mass extinction. So, as you know, the climate system is a highly nonlinear system. Whenever we talk about thresholds, like the carbon threshold, for example, in the oceans, that word threshold should key you in that it's a highly nonlinear system, and the changes that happen can be very disproportionate to the um, driving force once you pass this critical level or threshold or tipping point, if you like. So the perfect example of a highly nonlinear system uh, where tipping point actually means tipping point is if you're in a canoe. So you can be in a canoe with a bunch of people and the canoe can wobble from side to side and there's restoring forces um, so that it stays upright. But if you go past a certain critical threshold of tilt, then this the canoe can tip right over. And it's kind of irreversible. You know, once it tips over and you get wet, you get wet. So, you know, to recover, you generally have to get out of the canoe, right the canoe, get back in, and so on. So, you know, it's okay. There's a system, there's a zone of stability where the canoe is stable. And then if you exceed that boundary of the parameter, in this case, the angle of the tilt of the canoe, then you can reach a um, threshold and you get a nonlinear um, feedback happening or you, you, a tipping point happening. So another example is if you take a stick or a rod and you bend it, Okay, it will flex, and then you take the, the force off, it's called Hooke's Law, you apply a force here, it bends, okay, and the bending is proportional to the force, but, okay, so you're basically just stressing the atoms, but in a, an elastic fashion. If you bend enough so that the atoms start to deform, okay, then eventually the stick will snap. It won't return to the normal position. It can snap and break. So again, highly nonlinear situation. Neurons firing in your brain is another highly nonlinear situation. So the input side of the neuron gets different signals from other neurons. And if those cumulative sum of all those signals passes a threshold, then a signal will go along the neuron to the next neurons, but until you pass this threshold, you get nothing happening. So it's, it's all or nothing. Well, the carbon cycle, in the, especially in the oceans, is another example of this highly nonlinear effect. So let's get right into the details of the uh, news article and the reports. Okay. So just... Um, to remind you, this is my website, uh, paulbeckwith.net. Um, you know, please check it out. This is my last article. Sorry, I don't have Shackleton. Um, it's, it's too hot. We're in a heat wave here. It's very, very hot in the house. I just have a fan running. You know, he's sleeping somewhere. You know, cats sleep an awful lot of the time during the day. You know, they might sleep for 16 hours a day but you know when it's super hot you know they find a cooler spot and uh just uh sleep you know smart that's what we should also do in heat waves please con please consider donating to my um, paypal account to support my research and analysis and 
these videos that I produce. So this is my uh, Twitter account. They've changed the format of Twitter, the appearance, and this is the article, Breaching a Carbon Threshold Could Lead to Mass Extinction. Okay, so that's the article I'm talking about. Um, and this is the article, so it's uh, phys.org on that website. So basically in the brain, when neurons fire off electrical signals to their neighbors, it ha there's an all or nothing response. The signal only happens when conditions in the cell breach a certain threshold. So if we look at the neuron, this is the direction the message travels through this cell. There's these dendrites and they can be these, these like roots of a tree, if you like, and they all spread out these fingers to other neurons. So many other neurons fire, you know, if enough of them fire, the signal is, cumulate, is cumulatively increasing, added up or summed, and eventually if you pass the threshold, then the signal will travel along through the neuron to the um, exit points and go to other neurons. So it's an all or nothing response. So this is just uh, Google Images Neuron Anatomy to have a look at that. And now if you go to Google Images and do Neuron Threshold of Excitation, you get a bunch of different graphs. So this is the voltage. This is the time in milliseconds of a neuron. So you can get a stimulus of all of these different neurons firing, but you're not passing a threshold, so nothing happens. If you get enough of these guys to fire on the input, then it passes the threshold. Then you get a rising phase and then a falling phase, it overshoots and comes back here to the resting potential. So once you pass this threshold, the rate of change of the rising pulse and the characteristics that you see here are a artifact or a result of the neuron, the, um, the way the neuron is built. It basically it doesn't, this rise here, once the neuron fires, it will fire with this characteristics. And it could be, you know, it could be triggered from many, many different neurons, but diff, you know, not all of the same ones. So it, it, this is independent of the way it's initiated. As long as you pass the threshold, boom, you're underway. The system will, will go and respond. So this is what the uh, climate system can, can be like. So an MIT researcher has observed a similar phenomena in a completely different system, Earth's carbon cycle. So MIT study, Daniel Rothman, the rate found that when the rate at which carbon dioxide enters the ocean pushes past a certain threshold, whether as the result of a sudden burst or a slow steady influx, the Earth may respond with a runaway cascade of chemical feedbacks, positive feedbacks or reinforcing feedbacks leading to extreme ocean acidification that dramatically amplifies the effects of the original trigger. So let's look at the ocean acidification. Okay, so I'm just Googling Google Images ocean acidification graph. And this one here is on a time scale. This is millions of years before present. So here we are here. This is the pH of the ocean, um, roughly about 8.2 is sort of the mean if you like okay and here you know here it was in 1800 here it is in 2000 it's dropping extremely quickly on this time scale it's a vertical line so it was 8.2 on average at the surface of the ocean dropped to 8.05 in three or four decades that's a 30 percent increase in acidity and um, if it goes down to 7.8, 7.7, there's going to be huge problems for marine life. Uh, this is an article on ocean acidification, you know, where it shows this. Basically, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere dissolves in the ocean, making it more acidic. You form carbonic acid. This is inevitable with high carbon dioxide. The oceans have become already 30% more acidic since fossil fuel burning started. The acidification can kill corals, destroy other marine life. There's been no period like this. Uh, it says in the past 2 million years, but in the past 25 million years, there's been no, no period with a, an abrupt change uh, this, this rapid. Um, 
Okay, so let's go back to this. So Rothman looked at the geologic records and observed over the fast, last 540 million years, the ocean store of carbon changed abruptly, then recovered dozens of times in a fashion similar to the abrupt nature of a neuron spike. So you get all these different neuron spikes, but you know they're basically carbon spikes. They're excitations of the carbon cycle, and they occurred most dramatically near the time of four of the five great mass extinctions. Okay, there are various triggers to these events, um, and you know because dif you have different triggers, you have different um, rates of change of the ocean, of the CO2 going into the ocean, the acidification. Um, you can have high rates for short periods of time, or very small rates for large periods of time. The point is, is when you, it doesn't matter what initially causes the event, but once they're set in motion, the rate at which carbon increase was essentially the same. So think of the spike up of the nerve impulse. The rate, the, the characteristics of that spike up are dependent on the system. In the neuron case, the, the neuron structure. In the ocean case, the, uh, the, carbon, um, the, the carbon chemistry, if you like. Okay, so why 540 million years um, here? We can go to the Cambrian explosion. So 540 million years ago, we had Precambrian and Cambrian. This is the oxygen level in the oceans, very, very low. A couple, so one 800 million years ago, rose from 0.1% to maybe one or 2%. Then 602, 635 million years, glacial epoch, maybe a temporary spike in oxygen, but still very low. 580 million years, um, some, some animals started appearing. And then 542 million years, this is the dividing line, if you like, Precambrian to Cambrian, an explosion of life. Okay, they called the Cambrian explosion. Um, produced many of the animal types common today, such as arthropods, chordates, uh, you know, vertebrates, all kinds of animals. And, and we know from the fossil record, no hard skeletons before, so you, so very you can't get fossils really. No fossils left in the rock record after here, a proliferation of fossils. The point is 542 million years ago, the Cambrian explosion. Now the extinctions, the, the Permian, ex, the, the extinctions, the, the five main extinctions, and arguably we're in the six, are here. This is the, so you can see the increase of, this is the number of marine families, 1900 families living today diversity of marine animal families over geologic times. So this is Precambrian. Here we have the Cambrian 542 million years ago. We get an increase and then boom, we get an extinction, the end Ordovician extinction. And then we had another drop here, the end Devonian extinction, the end Permian. This is the granddaddy of all extinctions. It's basically when life nearly died. Um, and then there's the end Triassic, a small one here, and then the end Cretaceous, the, the dinosaur impact. Okay, now most of these are volcanic, um, huge volcanic um, eruptions going on. Um, this one here obviously was a bolide from space, a big uh, asteroid uh, from, from space hit the Earth. And, um, you know, it probably the shockwaves through the earth and the deformation from the impact probably triggered all these volcanic eruptions as well, causing this extinction. Okay, so remember those things. Um, so basically the oceans today are absorbing carbon at an order of magnitude, 10 times faster at least, maybe 20 times or 30 times even. The worst case in the geologic record is the end Permian, the big extinction. Um, that's this one here, that's a 252 million years ago. And um, basically we're, we're, we're uh, instead of increasing the carbon dioxide rate in the atmosphere and the oceans uh, at a slow rate over long periods of time, we're doing it very, very rapidly now. And the feedbacks are kicking in. And if we cross this threshold, we could go through, the system will respond by itself and we could go through into another um, mass extinction. So I'll talk about the scientific paper, uh, the peer reviewed paper next. Thank you for